Hello everybody, um, I'm Carsten. So who here uses Linux? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> who here only uses it on headless devices like servers? Okay, that's good, we got the right audience. Um, <laughs> who here knows what Wayland is? Okay, alright. All right. Um, um, who here knows how Wayland works and displays stuff? Okay, good. Now we're getting into that. Um, so, hello Wayland, goodbye, the year of the, of, well, goodbye X11. Um, at least that's what everyone's hoping. <laughs> and this is the year of the Linux desktop. Woohoo! Again. Um, yeah, you right. still need to do projections. Hmm? You don't need to do presentations. I don't? As, yeah, Wayland, as long as you don't have to do presentations. Oh, this, <laughs> isn't, no, this isn't Wayland. This is X. Yeah, this is X. No, actually, I, I swear it's probably the HDMI, because I tried this a few days ago and it worked, and the VGA has always worked perfectly. Um, so give me VGA, it works. Um, I don't know, I don't use the HDMI on this, so it's dodgy. Um, anyway, so who here knows the history of X? Where it comes from? Alright, this might be a refresher for some of you, for the rest of you. Um, welcome to the 1980s display land. That's what the X is, and it still is today, fundamentally. Um, it started back in the mid-1980s, it was actually called X10. Um, I actually don't know why they called it 10, they got up to version 10 really fast, I don't know the iterations. But then they got to version 11, and they never changed version ever again. <laughs> so since 1987, X has never changed its version. It's always 11. Yeah. Um, it was designed for laboratory environments at universities, where at the time, you couldn't really afford an expensive workstation that everyone had with their own processor and their own graphics. So they wanted something where they had cheap display terminals. You guys know what VT100s are, right? Yeah. 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 They wanted the graphical equivalent of a VT100 because that was cheap to make. Yeah. And that's what they were doing with the text terminals. And of course, you always try and do things the same way you're already doing it. Um, so it was also a way of people sharing a frame buffer a graphics device between multiple processes. Because otherwise it's basically impossible to do what you cannot share. You can decide that one process can write to it at a time, but if you want to have windows and things on screen and different regions rendered by different processes, you kind of can't really do that if you have a single frame buffer. Asterix, if you have lots of hardware layers and you can assign them to particular clients and their frame buffers, well, you can kind of do it. Um, so the quick and dirty of how X works when a client wants to create a window, it actually just says to the X server, please create a window of ID number 97 or some number. That's an X ID. When they originally connect, they negotiate an ID space, like a namespace, like you can choose numbers between here and here for your resources. If you choose anything outside of it, you'll be disconnected and killed. Um, so the clients actually allocate the IDs for a window. They then say, hey, by the way, change the window to this size. Then, oh, by the way, create a graphics context for me, please, with this ID. Then set the color to this. Then let me draw a rectangle over here. Um, load this font, blah, 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 etc., etc. That's how rendering works in X. And the X server itself actually does the rendering. The client does not do it. It just issues commands at kind of a higher level. Then when it's finished rendering, whatever the update is, it'll sit down, wait for events. When one comes in, like you press a button or something, or you move the mouse, or you click the word key, it'll get that press event, or get that mouse event, respond, decide to do something else, and send a whole bunch of drawing commands again. Rinse and repeat. That's how it works. So, at the detailed level, clients actually put the commands in a buffer. The buffer is just a region of memory with bytes. It's all a binary protocol. No fancy XML stuff here, thank God. Um, no JSON, no texty stuff. It's all just binary protocols. So it is actually relatively efficient across the wire. And then once they've filled this buffer with protocol requests, it can be more than one. They then send this over to the X server over a socket. It can be TCP. It could be local Unix socket. The server then goes and does the reverse. It parses that, figures out what the commands are, actually goes and does it. 
Um, and then, if the server has anything to say to clients, they go and fill a buffer with protocol bytes, and they go and write that down to the client, and the client does again the reverse. That is actually how X works. Interestingly enough, it's actually exactly how Wayland works too. Everyone just does protocols in buffers. Um, it's actually very simple. You can sit here and say, isn't there a better way? There actually really isn't a better way. Um, you can, people have tried wonderful experiments like shared memory buffers, where you have a shared memory pool and you write protocols to shared memory buffer and then the other side reads it out. It actually ends up being slower. To, you still need a socket to negotiate and wake someone up, so you need a file descriptor. But doing that actually is slower unless you have vast amounts of data, only then does it get faster. Doing the copies is actually faster. So this is how X works. Um, so the idea was the client just issues commands. It doesn't really do the rendering itself, the server does. The kind of nice thing about this design was that the X server now is actually capable of accelerating things. It does not have to render things using a CPU. It can render things using any piece of hardware it has. And the client does not need to know or care what that is. It's actually, it was actually kind of nicely separated. But the primary reason they did this is not because of acceleration. It's because at that time, shared libraries didn't work. So if you wanted to have rendering code in your app, guess what? It would have to be compiled into your process, and it would be all loaded into your process. Have a second process, it would load the same rendering code in. Have another process, load the same rendering code in. By having all that code in the X server, and you being able to access it via a protocol, you could share that code effectively over a network. But shared libraries now actually work, so we don't need that anymore. But this is the world the X server was originally designed in. Um, they do, do, do. It get, as I said, it can implement in hardware as well. That is a nice bonus, um, but it was really the shared library that was the main thing. Another major bonus was if you have remote displays, it keeps all the graphics data and information right where the screen is and any graphics processor and acceleration. So you're not continuously transferring lots of data back and forth all the time. It keeps it over there. Also an added bonus, it allows the client and server to work at the same time. If you have two CPUs on the same machine, or one CPU on this machine, another one on the next one, they can do things at the same time. Of course, they are two separate processes always. Um, but this is where things go bad. Of course, this is not actually that fast. If You always have to send everything over to the X server. Reality is that a lot of clients over time, more and more, have to actually render their own data and the standard X rendering <coughs> primitives couldn't do it. So you know what it started doing? They started using a CPU locally, filling buffers with pixels, then sending those pixels across. X actually had a mechanism for this called X put image. And sooner or later you started finding more and more clients just start X put imaging their entire window. Like everything, they're just simply sending, sending pixels all the time. This, of course, really, really sucks over a network. It's not compressed. Um, so a, a 1920 by 1080 screen, just a, 10, a 4K, a normal 1080 HD screen, full HD screen, at 32-bit color, which is what it is we actually throw away the upper eight bits, but it's still there, will cost you some in a region of eight megabytes of data per frame to upload. Now, try to put that across your local Wi-Fi network. Have fun. Um, it's not really, really good. Um, so people basically were using XPUT image. So what happened is, this wonderful extra thing was invented. Um, so what they did is, they used XPUT image, but they now added an extension, the MIT SHM extension. This is where you had a shared piece of memory for large amounts of data, where client writes into it, server reads out of it, for example, or reverse. And this sped things up dramatically. You can get easily like three to five times speed ups with this. Um, it's dramatically faster. But now X is no longer network transparent because your clients now have to either just use the MIT SHM extension and then not work across the network, or they have to have two pieces of code, code for network, code for not network. And this is where things start going bad. Um, so over time, X did fill some of the gaps that people were using put image for, like the X-Render extension, which allowed alpha blending, and um, that, in effect, allowed you to do things like anti-aliasing and all those other anti-alias fonts, etc. Um, but this was actually still pretty slow. I remember back in the early days, kind of earlier days when X-Render came out, um, I was writing a graphics engine. I had my own client-side code. That same graphics engine still runs today. 
Um, and I actually had X render code. And I ran the X render code. And the X render code was somewhere in the region of about 20 times slower than the code running on the CPU, just punching pixels. So in theory, it should be an acceleration mechanism. It was just a really good way of having really abysmal frame rate. Um, so you can tell people kind of didn't really use it that much. The only part of X render that was actually kind of decently implemented was the font rendering. That was the only bit that actually kind of worked okay. The rest of it was slow. Oh, Axtrix, it depends on your driver. Some drivers were okay, and they kind of were the same speed as the CPU doing the same thing. And others were absolutely horrible. Um, so now, everyone wants to do OpenGL. OpenGL comes from this wonderful <coughs> company originally called SGI, which we no longer have with us anymore. Rest in peace. <laughs> um, I remember when I was a student and I was going, I really want one of those indie workstations. If only I had $40,000 to buy one. <laughs> Sigh. Uh, so we couldn't. But OpenGL left SGI and came to everybody else as well, and now we get it. GLX started by being network transparent too. That's exactly what GLX protocol is. You actually have GL over the wire. You send all your commands over a socket, blah, 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 blah. Um, now the problem was, just like with the images, they started having performance problems. And so what eventually turned up is they had the concept of direct rendering, where the client didn't talk to the X server to render anything, they talked to the GPU directly, and the only time the X server was needed was, please swap a buffer, please display this frame, I'm done. That's the only time they had to talk to it. So that's when direct rendering came in, and now we have an OpenGL that's no longer network transparent, at least if you want to be vaguely fast. Um, so network transparency basically was dying. And it's been dying for a long time. So in the server-side rendering in the X server, we don't really need any more. We have shared libraries that can actually load all the same code into, the same, into more than one process and not actually duplicate that. Um, da -da -da -da. It was, um, um, oh yeah, um, so until the... Um, early part of the 21st century, you didn't have compositing. So clients were actually displaying directly to the X server. So when they rendered, it went straight, basically straight to a frame buffer. That's why, if you actually remember good old Windows and, um, and as X as well, you do things that you drag a window on top of something, you see trails, and you can watch it redraw bits of it as it goes along. That's because it's getting events saying this part of your window was damaged. Then sometime later the client responds and goes, oh, I'd better draw that. Oh, let me draw a line, let me draw another line, oh, let me draw this text, let me draw that rectangle, oh, let me draw this. And it's actually putting those things together one thing at a time in your frame buffer. The only reason you may not see it is it just happens to be fast enough for it to hide between a screen refresh. Um, but it is actually doing that. And it actually kind of leads to horrible artifacts. So once compositing came around, rendering no longer went straight to the frame buffer. It now went off to off-screen pixmap, so the compositor sometime later would copy onto the screen. Now what we've done is we've added an extra bit of indirection, so we can have nice little soft drop shadows and zoomy wobbly windows, etc. Because um, everyone wants that, of course. <laughs> um, but now that's adding to the pipeline. So what happens is your rendering bounces all over the place, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, so in X11, when you want to actually, um, for example, display a window, this is just starting to display a window. We won't get to rendering yet. <coughs> First you ask the X server to show or map the window. Then the window manager is told, by the way, this client wants to actually do this. What do you want to do? Then the window manager tells the X server, oh, by the way, I want you to do this. Then the X server will go, okay, how about, you know, um, how about this piece of information? Oh, okay, I need this piece of information. Oh, how about this? Oh, I need this. Oh, how about this? And they keep chatting back and forth to each other. And finally, finally, you actually get a window to display. And so you're basically bouncing between processes all the time to do this kind of stuff. It's not very pretty. Um, there are ways of reducing the amounts of bounces, but I'll tell you that that's probably several dozen round trips every time a window appears. So that slows down a window appearing. And then sometime after all that chatting, the actual application is told, oh, by the way, your window's now been shown. 
And that is actually a fairly reasonable amount of time. That can take many, many tens of milliseconds, if not several hundred milliseconds, depending on your hardware and where you are. And what that generally tends to lead to is these kind of artifacts. Have you ever seen those trails when you resize a window where there's kind of junk at the border? It's because the client and the compositor and window manager and the X server actually kind of all have different states at any one time. Because they're busy bouncing messages all around between each other about a single shared thing, which is the screen. So you tend to have like ugly results in trails. Um, so when you actually want to render in X, your extra application will go, oh, please draw this thing, oh, please draw this thing, and while it's drawn the first thing, the XO will go, oh, here, I'm going to create a damage event to the compositor over here, say some region got changed. And then draw something else, the compositor got another event, saying some other region of the window got a line drawn, got another region that was damaged, and so on, another region. And then the compositor will go, oh, okay, now I'll update the screen. Now he takes that pix map and actually goes and draws it to the screen. There, that is your latency between all these processes just to get something to the screen. It does actually really hurt, surprisingly. Um, so what you do is you get partial rendering, ugly, ugly stuff. Um, because you get a damage event, basically for everything you draw, the compositor has no idea really when you finish drawing. It just knows that something got updated and often they'll just kind of wait for a bit and then go and update, hoping that all the damage events will come in um, in the meantime. So, but if it doesn't, then those damages get fixed up in the next frame, but you will see artifacts. So even with compositing, you're going to still see artifacts. And that often leads to things like tearing, where in the middle of a window, like playing a video or things like that, you can see a line where there's like kind of one image and a second image. Sometimes like you see a triangle and two things because it's rendering two, um, um, two triangles of the same texture and they actually have a different state between those two triangle renders. Uh, da, da, da. Um, so one slight problem of doing all of this is that no matter what, if you're rendering client side with the CPU, at some point those pixels have to get copied out of that shared memory buffer to something that's displayable. Um, so this actually uses a lot of bandwidth. So as I was saying, it was about, it's almost about eight megabytes for a frame for full HD. Multiply that by four for four K. Um, and that's a lot of bandwidth. If you have small ARM SOCs and devices like my watch, this is not the kind of bandwidth you want to just throw around and ignore. You can't do that. And you have, your bandwidth is system memory, not dedicated graphics memory. So you're sharing it with the CPU and everything else and other parts of the OS. Um, so UHD is even more. You only need two gigabytes a second just to play. So, yeah, um, these are kind of bandwidths that networks could never keep up with. And even most machines actually can struggle um, unless you have a pretty high-end machine. So if you don't use OpenGL and MIT SHM to do this, it's even worse. There's even more copying having going on. And your frame rates can drop by huge amounts as a result. Um, this, of course, meant the X server is more complicated. It has to have a complete <coughs> rendering subsystem. And even worse, that rendering subsystem must be exactly the same on every single X server. They have, because you have to produce guaranteed results. You do operation A, and it must produce output B, exactly pixel for pixel, value for value. You can't do approximations, you can't, can't take shortcuts. So it ends up being kind of a pain to maintain. In the end, it's just a big blob of code that no one cares about and no one wants to maintain because it's boring. Um, so because this was a legacy decision, we're stuck with it today. And that's kind of the idea of why we're going to do Wayland. Um, so, okay, where were Input events for X. This is where things are a bit different. In X, it's really direct. You get an input, it goes directly to client. The window manager or compositor can't change that input. This is why in X you can't rotate a window. Because you can't go and rotate the coordinates before the client gets it. So that's why you just can't do that. And this is kind of important if you want to make, let's say, things like phones that rotate. It's kind of an important thing. Um, there are ways around that by having clients handle rotation all themselves. But then you have more synchronization problems as well. Um, you certainly can't have a window at 33 degrees at an angle or wrapped around a bunny rabbit. Um, and wrapping, wrapping your windows around bunny rabbits, that's the fun part. So what Wayland does instead, 
when you connect to the X server, actually it was not the X server, when you connect to the Wayland compositor, sorry, um, you basically connect, actually I lied there, there is a little bit of back and forth, go back and forth, but that's only on connection. But then when you create a service, you say create, then you set in buffer, you end your transaction, so now there's a transaction end protocol saying we're finished with all our drawing or any changes, and now the compositor can actually do updates if it wants or not. And the compositor will just send stuff back, for example, input, and when it needs another frame, it'll go and say, hey, please give me a frame. So frame rate should be driven by the compositor, not by the client. And that's actually a good thing, because it can actually adapt to frame rate on the fly based on what your output is. You can actually up and raise and lower your frame rate as you desire. Um, and so, yeah, they request the frame, do another render again, send another buffer along, and end the transaction, and you're finished. Because they're transactions, you don't get to see half a render, so things look okay. The um, artifacts are gone. So, in a Wayland world, the client is actually really in charge of rendering everything. They render title bars, they render the shadows around your window, they render everything. Window managers or compositors no longer put title bars or shadows anymore. Asterix, the KDE people want to keep doing that, but everyone else in the Wayland world tells them don't do it. Um, there are really good reasons for that. Um, and the clients basically process all the input, decide what to render, fill in a new buffer and send it back to the compositor. The server's responsibilities are managing the screen, the resources related to the screen, uh, input. It doesn't have to actually do any rendering for the client at all, other than presenting its window. How it presents it is relevant. It's also in charge of enforcing all policy. And since all input goes through the compositor now, it can change input to, for example, move the, you know, rotate the window 30 degrees and get the coordinates correct. correct. Um, in fact, technically, you can write a Wayland compositor that has no rendering code at all. All it does can assign a buffer to a hardware output and just choose which buffer to assign. It can actually live with zero rendering code if you want. Not so in X. Um, so yeah, just present what clients actually provide to the compositor. That's the job of the compositor. And decide where input goes to. That's kind of a very important thing. You don't want all your keystrokes going to that horrible app that's busy sending those keystrokes to someone on the internet. Um, so, that means now it's a year of Linux desktop, because we're actually shipping Wayland, obviously. Uh, well, okay, maybe not. I exaggerated my title. Um, it gets attention. <laughs> At least it's controversial, and that's the good thing about it. But, Wayland is actually shipping today. So, GNOME is actually shipping now. Mutter is shipping on Fedora 25, by default. It's no longer just an option or something you download an experimental package, it is what you get by default. Tizen is also shipping Wayland by default now in Tizen 3. Um, and Lightman's actually the compositor there as well. And it actually runs significantly better on low-end hardware than X11. I was going to bring my Raspberry Pi, I actually have a Pi top on my Raspberry Pi. The only problem is that for whatever reason, the HDMI connection to the internal panel is really dodgy. Um, and I couldn't actually get it to be reliable enough to bring it. <laughs> um, so I didn't bring it. But if you actually run on something like a Raspberry Pi, at least Enlightenment, which is pixel for pixel exactly the same in X11 as it is in Wayland, it has everything the same features. In Wayland, it pulls off 60 frames a second, but in X, you're lucky to get 30. So it run, you basically get double the frame rate um, from your compositor. There are good reasons for it. Um, but these are the kinds of things that Wayland was designed for. If you have a really high-end GPU, and even an Intel graphics card, Intel GPU is a really high-end GPU, I'm telling you, um, in the scheme of things. You probably won't notice it as much. Um, but it does run a lot better, definitely on the lower end hardware. And it is far more secure. In X, any client can pretty much listen to any input anywhere, anytime it wants. If you try and change this, you basically break clients. It's basically a requirement of them to run. In Wayland, it's designed so you actually have a very restricted client and can't do very much. Theoretically, a compositor can actually expose this if it wants. It would be an extremely stupid compositor to do that. But no one really is doing this today because everyone knows the security implications. Wayland is meant to work well with a sandboxed environment. I.e., if your processes run as a different user, 
all under some sort of under sandbox ID. It's assuming that you take care of this at the kernel and process level. Wayland can't solve that for you. That's the kernel's job. But assuming you got that correct, then it's not going to open up a big security hole over on the display server for you, which is what X11 actually does. Um, so yeah, no, no looking at what your bank account's doing, because that's what you can do today. You just go screenshot another window and read what's in your bank account and all your transactions. Probably not a good thing. Um, there are actually various compositors today. Western is in fact the default um, reference compositor. Um, it, before in X, you would have your X server, then a window manager. In Wayland, you don't have that X server bit anymore. You just have the window manager or the Wayland compositor. You choose which one you run. And that is that manages the whole thing. You don't have a shared um, display server at all. Western is only the sample compositor here. Um, that's what the developers said. There have been there have been arguments amongst developers that Western should have actually been the Wayland desktop, and it should have been more generic and do everything. But that's not how it was done. The KWIN guys, the KDE guys, are actually beginning really to work on Wayland now. Um, they kind of didn't do much for a while, but they're beginning to catch up. There's Sway. Uh, it's a tiling window manager, and if you check wayland.org, there's actually wayland.org, that's all. Um, there's a whole bunch of a list of more, and Arch has a wiki with a list of them, etc. Um, so what should you do? You should try and at least use Wayland today, see how it works. Um, if there are bugs, report them. I'll guarantee you that Wayland compositors can do far less than X servers can. A lot of that's by design for security reasons. Um, you do not want any client to be able to go and resize and move another window or fake input on it, which you can do like in a couple lines of code in X. Um, it's really trivial. Help fill in feature gaps. Actually, you know, propose new protocols that fill in the, uh, things that we actually really need that won't have security issues, or do them in ways that don't create a security issue. Um, and actually, if you're writing apps or you're working on toolkits, test them in Wayland. Um, keep testing them. If things break, report them to compositor developers, let them know because now we actually, clients are talking directly to the compositor and <coughs> if they either have a different interpretation of that protocol or there's a bug in one or the other, bad things happen. It tends to happen less in X because the window manager was less involved in getting things displayed on screen and wasn't even involved in doing input. Now it's involved in everything that happens. And use a well supporting toolkit. I've actually talked to people who want to write things with raw Wayland, I use the Wayland client, and it's very, very, very hard. You will have to do a lot of work. It is not designed to be easy. It does not do any much work for you. That's what toolkits are for. Use a toolkit. Unless you're writing a toolkit. <laughs> In which case, then okay, then you have to do the support. But I do not suggest using the Wayland client directly. It's probably going to be a waste of your time. Use a toolkit. Unless you're making it. So yeah, that's... I think I, uh, I'm over time, but it started late. Um, does anyone have any questions? Flames, comments, small furry animals. Oh, Full furry animal, yes. <laughs> oh, that's X Wayland. Okay. Ah, X Wayland. You run an you run a root. Okay, you know how um, X worked on Mac OS. Okay, Mac OS X actually shipped an X server. They ran a rootless X server. That means it has an invisible root window. You don't see it. And all the children of the root window actually get seen. And so we're doing the same with X Wayland. The X, the X Wayland server is actually an X Wayland client. And it just creates a new Wayland surface per immediate child of the root window. So that way, a window just pops up as if it's a Wayland surface and it deals with that translation for you. Would it be much to learn it? That depends on your drivers and the implementation. Um, <laughs> theoretically, it could be close to the same speed. There will always be some overhead because you're bouncing through another process. So for example, if you want to display a buffer, you have to first swap it using DRI protocol to the X server. The X server has to go, oh, now I've got a buffer. Oh, I've got to go pass it on to the Wayland deposit. So there's always going to be an extra bounce in the context switch. Um, that's the minimum. And the same input in reverse. So the input will have to bounce through. But you could force copies. I don't know if it's currently doing lots of copies all over the place. I don't necessarily think so. Um, but as long as it's implemented correctly without all the copies, it should be almost as fast. Um, yeah. Is that it?
Okay, everyone, go home, have dinner.